Hello everyone! We haven't done story time in a while. Today I'm going to take you through a more detailed history of the Lara Plantation that I mentioned in my last video, which if you haven't watched that, make sure you go back and check it out. If you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Janelle. I am a physician assistant and travel extraordinaire. I've been traveling for the last 23 years all over the world and continue to gather cultural stories, sustainable adventures from around the world to inspire, educate, and just create a family of like-minded individuals. Let's get into the story of the Lara Plantation. So just note that filming is not allowed on the Lara Plantation. However, I received special permission to film on the property and take photos. The Lara Plantation was prime ground for growing crops as it was considered to be on the more elevated terrain than other plantations. Most homes were built uh, by skilled African slaves that were mostly from Senegal who had really good experience building these stately homes in soggy and often uneven ground. So as you pull up to the Lara Plantation, you're greeted by this beautiful, colorful home, which is a typical Creole style or the Creole French style. Each tour is guided by a staff member to help preserve and prevent any damage from the many tourists that come through this home. So be sure to either book in advance or go early and get your ticket. So as your tour starts, you start in the basement of the big house where the plantation owners lived. If you look under the baseboards, you will see these Roman numerals carved into the base of the home. These were carved by slaves who were largely illiterate at the time, but they put the plans of, that they used that were numbered underneath so that if other people wanted to build the same type of home, they could know which plans they used. It was 1804 that the French naval officer, now forgive me for pronouncing these French names wrong, but I'll pop their names right here so you know what I'm trying to say. So Guillaume de Pri, with the help of Thomas Jefferson, was granted the land that Laura now sits on. The original home was actually in a U shape, but after the fire in 2004, it destroyed nearly 80% of the home. Now it's covered up in the back by plain planks, so you can kind of see where the fire had um, destroyed part of the, excuse me, part of the home. The original house was 24,000 square feet and had a 2,500 square foot kitchen, took 11 months to build and is actually built on a pyramid system with, with poles underneath eight feet underneath the ground so that when flooding came by, it would stabilize the home. Just remember that the modern day levees that we have today were not the modern day levees back then. And they needed to create a way to that their homes wouldn't blow away or even move away just with the flooding of the water. To give you an idea of who Guillermo Dupri was, Lara described him as a story that he actually killed his father's best friend, father's best friend's son in a duel for some unknown reason, which we can only guess. He gets shipped off to the Navy, helps in the American Revolution, and basically is granted a bunch of land so he doesn't go have to go have to go back and live with his dad. His wife, Nanette, took over the running of the plantation after he died in 1808, when the house was only completed in 1783. So this is the first of four generations of women, women who are running a plantation. Now, if that isn't cool, I don't know what is. I can only imagine what the gender roles were like back then though. A woman running a plantation wasn't exactly favored, but I will leave my own personal feminist musings there. So the plantation started off with 12,000 acres, which is about half the size of Disney World, basically huge. It had seven slaves to begin with, and most of them were from West Africa, and there was an American Indian that was also enslaved there. So when the Civil War hits, they had 185 slaves, 69 slave cabins, a bunch of mules and livestock. So before Nanette's husband dies, she has three children, Louis, Elizabeth, and Flaggy. So Elizabeth becomes important later in the story because she's the grandma of Laura LeCool, whose memoir we'll talk about later. Keep in mind the average life expectancy of someone during this time period is around 37 and Nanette lived until she was 94. Whereas rumored she would walk the halls of the plantation home with prayer beads in her hand singing the national anthem of France. Remember, this is the French South, not the 
romanticized version of the South that we know in movies today. Back to Nanette. The eldest son, Louis, goes to France because he has this violent temper. While she's still alive, he comes back because Nanette doesn't like the sound of Napoleon and all he's doing. So basically says, I'm gonna cut you off unless you come back. And he does with his wife, Fanny, and their daughter, Eliza. At this point, the plantation is very, very lucrative. And you can imagine the family dynamics when he returns. Louis with his short temper and, and the two other siblings who were helping around the plantation while he was gallivanting away in Europe. So Eliza, his Louis's daughter, is 16 and basically the heir to the entire plantation, being the eldest son's daughter. So her parents put a bunch of stress on her to become perfect and have a good match. And Louis and Fanny don't trust American doctors, so they take her over to France because she breaks out with acne to get a cure. Unfortunately, that cure is arsenic. And after injecting her with arsenic, Eliza dies the same day. So, Eliza's mom, Fanny, locks herself up in grief, thinking that she killed her own child from the pressure she was putting on her. Louis goes to New Orleans to live in an apartment with two teenage slaves as concubines. Yes, you heard that right. Moving on. Flaggy is not the eldest, but let's be honest, he was probably not the favorite, so he whined to his mother about the unfairness of life. And she basically gave him the plantation to run, as is common with second oldest children like myself. We tend to overcompensate just as Flaggy did when he decided to run the plantation, and he made the plantation a freaking fortune. However, Flaggy never got married, so now we have Elizabeth, who is helping run the plantation with Nanette as her business advisor. So, Elizabeth has two children, Emil and Amy. Emil was called a slave spoiler by Elizabeth because he was kind and empathized with their plight. Go Emil. So, as is customary in this family, family he gets sent back to France to correct his ways where he falls in love with law and justice, befriending Victor Hugo while he was there. Being a man of law is not considered prestigious at this time. Actually, being a farmer or a planter was. And oh, how times have changed now, right? So Elizabeth's husband dies, as well as her two older brothers, and then the Civil War breaks out. The family all flees up to the north, except for Amy and her husband, now Ivan. There were 40 plantations that were bombed along the Mississippi River. Out of the 400 existing homes that were bombed, there were those plantation owners that would not sign the compliance to the new rules when slavery was abolished. The family then returns after the Civil War to find that their home miraculously hasn't been touched one bit or jot. So the plantation life resumes. With many of the slaves that had previously worked the plantation, they were freed men of color now because they only sp spoke French though, they really had nowhere to go and were completely illiterate. So they stayed on the farm. They were quote unquote paid for their work, typically receiving an invoice at the end of the year, stating how much they actually owed for the tools and everything else that the plantation had given them. Now this was not just the Laura plantation, but it was many plantations did this along the Mississippi River as they adjusted to the new life after the Civil War. Elizabeth, Emile, and Amy's mother is now getting up in age. Nanette is still alive. They divide up the plantation between Emile and Amy. Amy's husband Ivan, he's not a really good guy. So, although the Civil War hadn't ended, this caused a civil war within the Lara Plantation. When Emil did get back, he had the first pick and he chose the big house. But the big house didn't have the sugar mill. That went to Amy and Ivan. Basically, they didn't play nice. Emil starts planting the sugarcane crops with the slaves that agreed to help him. Ivan starts planting his, but then when it comes time to process the sugarcane, Ivan backs out of the deal, 
of lending the mill, Emil is frantic and has to put all of the sugarcane crop into box cars, train box cars, with the help of the slaves on the plantation to push it over to the next plantation was like 10 miles away so that he could at least have some money to sustain the farm through the next year. According to Lara's memoir, her father was a very kind man who would often stand up to his mother to keep slave families together, buying slaves with his own money to keep them together and on the farm and the plantation. Ivan, Amy's husband, and Elizabeth, Emile's mom, still favored really the old ways of the French South and the grandeur of society they would often be able to participate in. So the former slaves that had previously built the sugar mill, which was now Ivan's, Emile gave the money to this guy to build a new sugar mill for him. Well, he takes all the money and then runs away and Emile has to take out a mortgage on the home to build a new sugar mill. He's really distraught. He's always good with his money and just wants to be kind and do the right thing. Emile and his wife, who would would commonly actually go out to the freed slaves on the plantation and they would take care of them with their own births, um, with the sicknesses, they would set up schooling up until Emil's death at 57. However, before his death, Lara had been going to boarding school to find herself a match. Her father left the running of the plantation to her brother George and the overseers, even though George was really young at the time. He continued to run it as his father did, but had to sell off much of the land in front of the home to pay off all the debt that Emil had gone into because of Ivan and Amy. So let's go back to Laura. So Laura is the main person in this story. So after coming out in society with her debut, she went to many balls, she went to boarding school, ends up standing next to her husband at a wedding, Charles Gore. Well, Charles Gore had just lost all his money out in South Dakota trying to start up a cattle farm, so he goes back to St. Louis, become, works his way up over six years to become basically the head honcho of an insurance company. So Laura go back, goes back to the plantation, kind of withdraws from society because she has been secretly engaged to Charles Gore and keeps that secret for six years. So after Lara's grandmother dies and her mother, the price of the sugar plummeted and the plantation continues to fall into debt. Lara ends up getting married to Charles Gore who moves her up to St. Louis where she lived out the remainder of her life, ending up pretty much becoming penniless. George is helped out by their uncle but eventually has to sell the farm to the Wagesback family and the plantation eventually gets abandoned in 1984 where the governor of Louisiana owned it for a time hoping to make money from selling it to the state, but that failed. So it falls into ruin and disrepair for many years until the private Laura Plantation Company comes to buy it and is now owned by Norman and San Marmion. According to my research anyway, if that's incorrect, please let me know down below and ignore my dog barking. <laughs> So now we have a beautifully restored French Creole home in, and that they have done a really great job inviting, you know, the slaves from the, the Lacoule family back to private parties to share in history and share their stories and often meet each other for the first time because slaves were often sold from one plantation to another and they would lose touch. So be sure to read the memoirs of Laura Lacoule it has a lot of the history of this plantation and the information that I had gotten in this video was saved because of her memoir. So I focus much of the video on the story of the big house and the owners, and I will dive into more detail about the slaves on the plantation. But this gives us a good starting point of where Louisiana began to be colonized by the French and how times changed drastically from being the French South to the purchase of Louisiana by the United States, the Civil War, the end of slavery, slavery and the or the transition of the freedmen of color and how the history of these plantations is important not just to the big house descendants but also for black history for many families who were split apart during these times uh, across many plantations and are now using funds to save the history of these places so that they can come back 
look at the genealogy and uh, do their own DNA testing to see where part of their history is from and maybe reuni reunite with family members they never knew they had, share the stories of their ancestors and their um, journey to freedom. I hope you enjoyed this story about the Lara Plantation. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share with a friend because more the merrier. Make sure to stay tuned as I will be sharing the stories of the Destraham Plantation as well as Oak Alley and the Swamp Tours in Louisiana. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!